Hello and welcome everybody. Oh, make sure this is going out. Let me know if you can hear me in chat. My name is Ben or Foligan and welcome. Welcome to the Pixelogic ZBrush channel. Again. Oh, yeah, I think we're good. Cool. Uh, so welcome everybody. Tonight we're going to be doing the same thing that we've done for I think the past four or five streams and that is working on this beautiful concept by Dan Kelby over here. You guys should absolutely go check out some of his work. He's got some really cool uh, stylized characters, a lot of uh, animal kind of creatures in the style of what I would consider kind of Zootopia-esque. If you guys are interested in finding a cool concept to work on, definitely check him out, Dan Kelby. Um, but yeah, I'm Foligon, and tonight we're going to spend about two more hours on this guy. I think we're around like the 10 hour mark uh, right now. And I plan on finishing this guy tonight, or at least getting uh, very, very close. So this will probably be our last stream working on this guy. We might have a little extra time uh, in the future for maybe like one more, or maybe kind of like a, a post-mortem kind of deal or something like that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But let's go ahead and just go and get started. Not waste any more time. But yeah, Chris, awesome. Can you hear me? Everything's good. Beautiful. Love it. I was just uh, working on this bottle a little bit right before the stream, kind of setting up the pattern there, making sure that I'm getting the proportions correct. Looks to be uh, pretty close to me right now. I'm gonna add in a couple more things to that later on, but let's go ahead and see what else we got on the list and we can just kind of chill, hang out here tonight. We're not... Uh, we're not in any rush or anything like that, so feel free to ask any questions in chat, and I, uh, I would be happy to stop and try to answer as best as I can. But yes, let's see. Let's look at fixing his feet and some of the stuff in his tail as well. I did a little bit of... Uh, honestly, I've really only blocked out the shape of the tail here. Very simple geometry, I believe... I believe I used my cube tube brush to make this, if I remember correctly, and then used the Z modeler brush to start doing some stuff like beveling edges to get certain uh, specific shapes in there and adding in additional edge loops with the insert edge loop function or poly loop function. Same, uh, same difference, right? Uh, but for our stripes, or actually we should kind of paint this up first and get that natural kind of gradated color there. Uh, but instead of hand painting it, which is always kind of a pain in my opinion, uh, we can use masking, I think, to our advantage here to get this gradient-like effect. Really, um, it's hardly orange at all there on the top. So what I will do is, let's go ahead and do some quick selections. So I'll just use my select rectangle Select this top half here, and now we can run what is called an auto groups function, which you can fi find down in your polygroups menu right here at the very top. And essentially, what auto groups does is it will look at the different polygon islands that you have, even if these are technically connected to something because they are temporarily hidden right now it will treat them separately and group each one individually, which is a nice little trick. Use it all the time. So from here, let's go ahead and just control click with our transpose line or 3D gizmo. Get that masked off. And because poly paint is determined by the resolution of our geometry, if I just fill this in, you know what? Honestly, that's not really that bad, but let's go ahead and get some extra geometry in here and uh, make that gradient maybe, and the poly paint maybe a little bit higher resolution. Our tail is looking a little blocky as well. I think we can get a little bit more rounded here. So to do that, let's go ahead and do uh, another quick little mask, little mask trick again. This time we'll grab the poly groups on the sides and make sure we have all of that selected. Whoops. Invert our selection, just control, click on the canvas, easy peasy. That'll mask off the sides. And now what I plan to do is inflate that. But before I do that, I'm gonna try control tapping once. Essentially, I only want the um, that middle poly loop to be masked. 
So we can control tap to try to mask that only. Let's see how we did. So we're still getting a little bit of an effect on that purple polygroup. You know what? I think that'll be fine for what we're trying to do. So essentially I'm just gonna use the deformation palette and run a quick little inflate here. So I don't know exactly what number I want, so I'm just gonna click and drag and play around with that and attempt to round out that tail a little bit more. So it's kind of pulling the edges a little bit there as well. So I think I wanted to do a little, you know, save myself a little time, but honestly, this takes five seconds for me to make a quick little mask here. So we'll make sure that we do this correctly and only get the vertices that we want to affect. What's awesome about working with low poly stuff here in ZBrush is that, you know, I know ZBrush is a sculpting program, but you would be surprised by how often I just do some quick little poly modeling with the Z modeler brush and um, use, instead of subdivision levels, just use dynamic subdivision levels, which aren't really subdivs, they're kind of like a smooth modifier almost, a pre-visualization of subdivision levels, which is here in your dynamic subdiv menu. You can turn that on and increase the smooth subdivision count. So this is essentially, uh, if you were to put this on, let's say four or five, for example, because that's what my finger landed on, uh, this will pre -vis of what it would look like if you applied five subdivision levels to that model. All right, let's set it back to two, invert our mask, and now we can hopefully inflate properly. Try to round this out, get it away from feeling so boxy. I am going to mask off that end point, because that one doesn't need to grow, and inflate out a little bit. And that is starting to feel a little bit rounder. Awesome. It looks a little bit flat to me, so I think I'm gonna keep it uh, kind of a little bit squashed how it is right now. So I think that works. There's some points where it gets a little bit wide here, so maybe we can just use our move brush and push some verts around really quick. Should be good to go though from here. Oh, our poly paint, because our poly groups aren't aligned the way we want, should probably get a little bit of twist in there. I think I'll do that by actually twisting the geometry. So we'll do that real quick. Mosin, what's going on? Welcome. As well as Zai Senaru Kitsune. Welcome as well. Hello everybody. And welcome to the stream. Continuing to work on our tiger character tonight. Probably the last stream working on this guy. So we'll uh we'll send him out with a bang. Try to do him justice. I'm going to try rotating this a little bit here. I'm going to kind of mess this up a little bit. Because I really want the poly group to inform the poly paint here. So I prefer, if I can, to keep that kind of uh, without the twist. or It's kind of twisting right now. I don't want it to twist. Kind of hard to see with the polygroup visualization on, but essentially that polygroup is wrapping up in a kind of an awkward way. So I'm trying to uh, stick that back in his butt, <laughs> and we can move on from here. And for the stripes on the tail, I was thinking about it. I I think I might do the same technique that I did up here on the uh, the head slash neck slash body. He's kind of um, kind of like a cylinder dog almost. I don't know if you guys know about cylinder dogs, but they're great. Um, he doesn't really have much of a neck, right? So I don't really know what you'd call that. But uh, I'll probably do the same technique, which is actually by using geometry. We'll show it off again here in a little bit. Striker. What is going on? Welcome. DD, what is new in ZBrush 2019? There are quite a few new things in ZBrush 2019. Uh, there is an overhaul to the camera and perspective system in ZBrush. Some new modeling tools called Snapshot 3D, which are really cool. Uh, folders, which everybody loves, right? There's, uh, there's a bunch of new stuff. If you want to uh, learn more and check out 
some tutorials on some of those new features, over on my YouTube channel, Folygon, I have a playlist with, uh, I think, seven or eight tutorials. ZBrush 2019. That's right. Z with two, four, six, eight. Eight tutorials going through, like I said, the camera folders, NPR was a pretty big deal as well. Uh, and then there's some additional plugins and some other cool stuff in there as well. Definitely check it out. There's some good stuff in the new update here. I'll, uh, here, I'll cut the, uh, cut and paste the playlist in there for you so you can check it out. Maku, what's up? Welcome. How you doing? Mahmood, hello, hello. Trying to move this tail quick. Being awful slow about it. Looks like it got a little squished. That's okay, we can fix that. Fix a squished tail. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm still getting a nice curve from the profile, which could probably push it a little bit more. And from the backside, see how that kind of has like a awkward hit there? We'll fix that up a little bit. Awesome. There we go. What a beautiful tail. All right, so we fixed the shape now as well as the direction slash twist of what's going on there. Don't know what I'm doing with my hands. It's my Italian coming out. Uh, but now for the stripes. So I mentioned that we would do a similar technique to what we did on the head, but I'll probably uh, cheat it and do it a little bit faster. So let's look at that real quick. Absolutely, man. My, uh, my pleasure. Yes, the folders. I'm using the folders right now. I think I have uh, three or four set up in here. Uh, one thing that I actually um, started doing just uh, just before this stream, I was like, oh, you know what would be a good idea? So what's, what's really nice about ZBrush is that you can, one feature that I use all the time, is that you can toggle visibility for everything in your subtool list, uh, in, for everything in your subtool list by shift clicking on an object that you have selected. So if I shift click this, or if I shift click the eye icon, it will hide and show everything, except it won't toggle the visibility of a folder. So if you have a folder's visibility toggled off, like I do down here, then it won't be affected by that. So you can still toggle everything on and off, but still keep a folder kind of temporarily hidden, which is what I've done here with this junk folder at the bottom of my subtool list. So I have all these these subtools in here, right? We can collapse all these folders real quick. That's not in a folder. We should put that in a folder. And then I have this junk down here. So as I'm essentially creating stuff, uh, the way you would work in the past in ZBrush is if you use something to make uh, like a Boolean or something like that, you might save that out separately because you don't want it staying around, floating around in your file, taking up space, but uh, taking up like visual space file size if that's an issue for you you can still get rid of it but now but now you can have like a little junk folder down here of uh, essentially my junk is just live boolean stuff that I'm not using anymore so I might want it later but for now just keep them down there in the bottom let's make a new folder for this guy though for a little bottle new folder I'll call you bottle or maybe uh here here we'll call you tiger protein tiger tiger protein Sure, works for me. And we'll just drag and drop all these little chunks in there, and voila. I'm gonna open these back up, because I like to be able to see my subtools. All right, now let's go back to our tail. And uh, probably add in some subdivision levels to this. Like I said, poly paint resolution is defined by your subdivision levels. So if I were to, I'll sample this little red color over here. 
So if I step back down to where I was, all the way on this low subdivision level, and try to paint, whoops, we'll turn off lazy mouse, you can see that it only works where those vertices are. So I can't paint here, but I can apply it to that vert, that vert. And then if we subdivide and increase the resolution, you can see that I can paint more because we have more vertices. So we don't actually want that red color. Uh, so I'll, I'll delete that for now. And now, now we're gonna do a little trick here to do some stripes on our tail very quickly because I'm lazy and don't wanna paint them. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna use the slice curve brush. If you hold control and shift, it's up here, slice curve. I just have it in my quick pop-up menu. And essentially what I'm gonna do is slice up a few different sections based on what I'm seeing here. I'll turn off the line so you can see a little bit better. And these are essentially going to be the stripes that I create for this tail. I will also delete some of the excess here just so you can kind of get an idea of where we're going with this. And then I'm going to just fill these with a black color after I am done. And whoa, try to remo re remove, <laughs> remove a few different sections very quickly. And I think you can kind of see how this is shaping up. So I am using this as a reference. I don't need this to be pixel perfect though, so I'm not going to sit here and line it all up. I'm just making sure that everything that I am creating for these stripes isn't super parallel and very boring. That's never fun. We don't want to see that. That never looks good. That's just one of those little fundamentals we like to keep in the back of our head. What is this one doing? It's going a little bit wide here. It goes super thin to super wide. So that's pretty easy. And we'll just continue slicing up some more stripes. Nothing too crazy. And I'll fill that. I'll fill that with a black color in a minute. It's a little bit easier to see when things are not filled with a black color, so I'll wait to do that. Seth, what's going on? Welcome to the stream. Uh, Seth says, "Hi, I'm pretty new to ZBrush. Is it safe to update to the new version as they come out? Do they release more stable versions later?" A la Maya. Uh, yes, um, yes, it is safe to update to the newest version. Uh, I am running ZBrush 2019 right now, and I can confirm that it is more stable than the last version. And as they continue to release more versions, it continues to become more and more stable. Uh, ZBrush 2019 right now is the first, you know, what you could call the first version of the 2019 series, but I'm sure they will continue to to update that as it rolls up, or rolls out, I should say. Um, but yeah, it's always you know getting more stable as it goes. Compared to 2018, ZBrush 2018, if you were on that version previously, I have a lot less crashes in ZBrush 2019. Other people might have other experience, but that is you know what I've been experiencing. In terms of safety, though, <laughs> safety for an update. I guess that's a funny way to weird it, or funny way to word it. But uh, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with it. Should be good. Right, we'll do a couple more of these. His butt's never really going to be seen, so I'll try to wrap this up quick. Do a couple more here. Doesn't need to be incredibly specific, especially now that we can't really see what's going on. So we have to make some of these up a little bit. And let's see, where's that booty? All right, let's see how much further we have to go. So somewhere about there. All right, cut these out. I'll do one more of those kind of doubled up stripes. 
Beautiful. All right. Let's give this a quick black color. And we have some stripes. But the geometry is perfectly overlaid over top of the, um, the actual tail. So what we're going to end up experiencing is not clean edges, even though we do have very clean edge loops for these pieces. Um, so to fix that, I would normally inflate something like this, but inflation on geometry that has an open edge, like these slices, uh, tends, to, tends to normally be good. But in this instance, for sliced geometry with a slice curve brush or, uh, or even a clip brush, it tends to get a little wonky. So, whoops. So what I like to do is just increase the physical like attributes here, just the size, just a little bit. Oh, maybe I did that wrong. Let's undo real quick. Did I modify that one? Ah, I see. I see what's wrong. All right, let's try this. Normally, I wouldn't want to do this, but it should work fine. Oh, we have one kind of big section here. Let's cut this guy out. But now that geometry should be overlaid enough to be fine. Like I said, we're going to do the stripes a lazy way. Which one is this? So we got one, the two, one, tiny, a little bit of a fatty here. So I'll just make that a little bit smaller. A little bit too thick. Beautiful. All right, so we got some quick stripes going on. I'm into it works for me all right next up on the list let's see what we got Bardna welcome how you doing man uh, so tail check I need to change some of the stuff in the feet I have made our eyes a little bit wider there might be some more stuff I want to do up in the face but other than that, we are pretty close to being done with this guy. Uh, some other stuff that can happen in the, the bottle for the text, obviously, that sort of thing, as well as some additional stuff that we could do in the hoodie, the sleeves, and everything else. There's always more room to push uh, on a character. Typically, what, what I encourage people to do is after you get to a point where... You kind of feel like you're done with something, like you can't push it any further. I definitely recommend taking a little bit of a break from what you're working on, whether it's a character or, you know, anything else. It doesn't really matter. Take a little bit of a break and just kind of rest your eyes. It could be a day, it could be an hour, it could be a month. I don't know. And then uh, come back to it. And typically, after you take that little bit of a break, you'll find uh, a bunch of new stuff kind of sticks out to you that you didn't notice before. And I'm probably not going to do that this time around just because we're trying to do this pretty quick. Wrap this tiger boy up. Oh, you know what? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick little projection on these because I want to fix some of the shapes here. Let me do this very quick. We'll do a zero mesh and projection on both of these feet. I'll up the poly count a little bit. Uh, tutorial in Spanish, please. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish. So uh, I know there are many people here on the Pixelogic ZBrush channel that do speak in Spanish. So here on the Pixelogic channel, if you're new here, uh, there are a ton of different... What's going on there? There are a ton of... Oh, okay, I see. We'll, we'll fix this real quick. There are a ton of different uh, artists here that stream. I think there's maybe... Uh, I, I'm not sure who all is active currently, but actually, if you go to the ZBrush live stream calendar, you can see everybody that's streaming. Uh, and there are definitely a few that stream in Spanish. So check out the list. Go to the, uh, if you just Google ZBrush Live, it'll probably be easier to find, or you can just go to pixelogic.com slash ZBrush Live. 
But yes, tons of different people. The whole schedule is is decked out, and you can also check out the presenters and see all the different people on here. How many people are on this list now? There are a lot. Two, four, six, eight, ten, uh, fourteen times three. Is that forty-two? Is that right? So there's a lot. Quite a few. But I am not one of those that speak Spanish, unfortunately. I wish I could. I wish I was a uh, multilingual in that regard. I unfortunately only speak a little bit of Japanese, but I have no one to practice with ever, so uh, it's fading. <laughs> All right, I am going to fix this. Here, you know what? I'm going to do this to one first, and then I'll probably just duplicate it over to the other side instead of wasting time. Oh, you know what? I need a projection quick, or pro projection first. Do that real quick, and then we'll fix our material. Uh, yeah. So I want to, there's like a little bit of this like tight transition that happens towards the top of the foot that I would like to get in there. Feet are honestly such a small part of a character and they're rarely looked at. So <laughs> I don't like to spend a ton of time on feet personally. I don't like to spend a ton of time on hands for the same reason. Hands are very tough to sculpt, but they're very rarely kind of closely inspected in my opinion, unless it's something that's gonna be a, uh, like a really big kind of feature, like a first person kind of perspective for a game or something like that. You'd obviously want some really nice looking hands, but um, you know, you gotta consider how long people look at your stuff for. And I mean, if you're trying to make something for a client or you know portfolio piece, you obviously want to put as much work into it as you possibly can. But uh, for something like this, this is just for fun. So it's my uh, my tiger. I can do whatever I want with this this guy. But we also want to do justice to Dan Kelby's concept over here as well. So we'll spend a little extra time on the feet, even though I don't want to. <laughs> All right, that's starting to feel a little bit better to me. Maybe just a little fix there on the pant leg. And now I will probably do a quick little trim on the bottom of that foot. And I will temporarily delete my subdivision levels. You could also freeze your subdivision levels, uh, but I am not a huge fan of freezing subdivision levels um, because that allows for um, automatic reconstruction of your subdivision levels after you unfreeze them, and I prefer to have the ability to manually control that. I find that there are a lot of issues that come with auto reconstruction of subdivs. So I will temporarily delete my subdivs and then show you guys how to reconstruct them here in a sec. And that doesn't need to be absolutely perfect. The geometry is different, so it won't be perfect. Delete you, merge our feet back down together, and down here in your geometry palette, reconstruct subdiv. And we'll just click on this a few times until we get back to that base subdiv. And we can step back up. And there we go. We got our feet. Beautiful. Beautiful little, little nuggets down there. <laughs> Let me look at this pant leg as well. Just move some stuff around here. Make sure that that's fitting up nicely.
Uh, what button is it for the pop-up menu? This is a part of my custom UI. It is Control Shift Q. If you have my custom UI there, which is over on my Gumroad, which is just gumroad.com slash polygon, there is a hotkey file in there and it has all the hotkeys listed in that document. Do I use any other modeling software? Yes, I do. I got started uh, using Maya way back when I was more into animation and kind of physics sims and that kind of thing. And at the time I wanted to do animation. Uh, but now I pretty much exclusively use ZBrush for all of my work. This guy has been completely created in ZBrush, been in ZBrush the whole time, and the entire process is over on YouTube if you guys wanna go check it out. Uh, there might be a link down below, but if not, uh, just Google Pixelogic YouTube channel and uh, you'll find it, as well as a playlist full of, full of my work on this dude. Uh, but yes, I think I'm fine with those feet for now. We won't do anything else to them. I think we're good to move on. I had some ideas for the font on the bottle. There is a deformer. Let's go ahead and try to get the font close first. What what font you guys think that is? Does anybody anybody with font knowledge out there know what the nitro font is right there? Let's let's try to figure this out. So we'll go into our Z plugin menu under Text 3D and vector shapes. New text, nitro, or actually, we want that to be all caps, nitro, right? And then, so it is a sans serif, sans serif font. <laughs> Noda, we're actually kind of close to nitro. But I don't know, we'll, we'll find something. It's got a little bit of skew to it, so some kind of maybe italicized font, maybe like an impact or something like that. And we can maybe make this work. It doesn't have to be perfect, but if anybody knows what that font is, that'd be awesome. Can't see much of the font. Well, let's blow it up. There we go. That's probably a little bit better. So Nitro, Nitro and Stalker. Um, the person who drew this obviously just kind of like hand did this font from what I can tell. But if there is a font that anybody knows of that looks similar, well, that would make things a lot easier. I'm, all, I'm fine with just using impact though. Like I said, I think this is a pretty close font to the idea that we want. Oh, move our font up here with our bottle. We'll adjust that. How many polygons? Uh, I don't know. It looks about 10 million. About 10 million polys right now. David asks, I was wondering about how you put together your block out for this dude. Dynamesh or primitives? What did you do? How'd you do it? Um, like I said, the entire video process is over on the Pixelogic YouTube channel. So, Pixo, uh, I even have it over here as well. I think this is the first one. So essentially, whoop, there you go. So, typically when I'm blocking out characters in the early stages, I will start with a primitive shape, typically a sphere, for pretty much everything and start pulling it out with the move brush, dynameshing, moving uh, parts and pieces together, dynameshing those together, and just kind of cutting things up as I go. So it's a pretty simple process, um, not too hard, not complicated at all, literally just move brush the whole time. <laughs> so it's not, um, not super complicated or anything like that. 
but it's all about uh, kind of understanding the fundamentals and what you're trying to create. But yeah, I actually have, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, but I have a new course coming out on Thursday. That is something that I've been working on for the past, uh, I thought it I thought it was like around six months, but I, I actually checked today. I started working on this over eight months ago. So I've been working on this new course for quite a while, but um, if you guys are interested in learning more, registration is gonna be opening up on Thursday, which is in two days from now. So if you're watching this later on, uh, and it is past April 4th, then registration is already open. And you can go to my YouTube channel, just youtube.com slash Folygon to learn more. But let's go ahead and get this font lined up here and move from there. Uh, Fabio says, I'm just discovering the ZBrush because I started from one week with the software. I was looking for something about Sculpting Pro that doesn't let to use Dynamesh. What is the workflow between them if you use both? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by both. So you mentioned Dynamesh. Sculpting Pro. Sculptress Pro, I assume is what you mean. Yes. Uh, you can absolutely use Sculptress Pro and Dynames, uh, Dynamesh at the same time. I don't know what's going on with my tongue tonight, but my tongue is just like exhausted, apparently. Got a little lift going on there. Um, but... Uh, you can use Sculptress Pro and Dynamesh at the exact same time. While you're using Sculptress Pro and you know you want to remesh something really quick, you can adjust your Dynamesh resolution down here and just click on the Dynamesh button and keep going from there. Uh, it's probably not necessary though because if you're working with Sculptress Pro, you're probably um, already getting your geometry to be tessellated already. So it shouldn't be shouldn't be that big of an issue. It should be, um, should be fine to just use Sculptress. All right, we need a quick little crease going on here. So let me set up some creases, make sure that's good. I'm just gonna use this font. There were no font smiths in the chat, which is fine. And I'm just gonna manually give this a quick little italicization. I, is that a word? I'm going to give it a quick little skew. <laughs> and let's see. Try to fit this in here. And then we need to wrap this around our bottle. And there are uh, a few different ways to do this, do, do something like this. But I think the way that I'm going to use it, or the way that I'm going to do it, I had an idea. I think there's a deformer that should be able to help us out. And I don't use this deformer very often, so you'll have to give me a second to find it, but it essentially allows you to take geometry and wrap it into a 360 degree angle. And I have a feeling it should rotate maybe, or maybe not. It might even be twist. I don't know, I'll have to play around. Honestly, I have not used this deformer in a very long time. Oof. Well, we know it's not that one. Uh, Bendark, are you are you our good pal that we're looking for, Bendark? You might be. Let me find out. Nope, not Bendark. <laughs> well, I might do this in my own time. Uh, I really can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Like I said, I don't, I don't use that deformer very often. It's a very specific deformer. Mm -hmm. Well, that is not a big deal. I will take care of that later. I'll have to look it up in the documentation. And we also need another font, this time for Stalker. So let's do that really quick. And that is all caps as well. Oops, Stalker. And I think for this font, we want something a bit more thin. Uh, so let's do, uh, I don't know, maybe, Roboto thin. 
I like this font a lot. And that might be a little too thin. Let's see. Playing with fonts, isn't it fun? Let's do Roboto Regular. I think that'll work. And this one is going to be black. Yeah, you guys didn't expect to come here and play around with fonts tonight, did you? But uh, for those that are new here, the Text and 3D Vector Shapes plugin, that is in your Z Plugins menu. It's an awesome little tool for creating your fonts very quickly. Get a quick little organization here. And let's get our font down where we need it. Whoops. Scale that, put it into place. A lot of the times the scale isn't strong enough. So you can just come into your size modifier in here and just manually adjust your size. So make sure we space these out appropriately. Should also fill that color in. Now, of course, you could do this as a texture map as well. I wanted to show off the text and 3D vector shapes plugin. Plus, it's fun to play with. And like I said, I'll wrap those around later. A cute font called Lance that could match. Well. I'm sorry that I just saw that now. I will have to look up the Lance font in the future. Always hand trace and manipulate outlines in Illustrator. That is always another way to do it. Typically what I do is I cheat a little bit in Illustrator and I'll do an image trace, uh, image trace first in Illustrator, then uh, expand it to get the actual vector, con like vector data and then edit it from there instead of just kind of doing it from hand in the very beginning. It's a little bit faster. I uh, love how you explain stuff. Awesome, man. Glad to help out. The How about the brush that pushes it to the background object? So the matchmaker brush is what you're referring to, I believe. Um... With the geometry on this, I think we're going to get some pretty iffy results uh, at best. So for something like this, I would, because this is a, a bottle, it is a cylinder. Like I said, there are a lot of ways to go about doing something like this, but because specifically this is a bottle, uh, I think it's going to be a lot easier if I use that deformer that wraps around. I really, one more, one more glance here. I know it's not the bend curve because I use that. It does sound like it should be the bend curve, right? Uh, but I use I use the bend curve quite a lot. I know it can't be the extender because that is that new guy. I think from 2018. But yeah, I'll uh, I'll look it up and I'll probably show it off in a future video for you guys because it's actually a pretty cool tool, and I just don't use it very often. There are a bunch of deformers in there that are, you know, for kind of specific scenarios. All right, let's go on back to our tiger, tiger buoy. See what we got going on here. All right, so I'll make a note that I will mention that in a future stream. Once I find out what it is. I'll have to dig through the Z documentation though. All right, so what else we got going on here? There's a lot of kind of little uh, adjustments and things I want to do here, but for the most part, I would say that this guy is is done. Um, I was talking a little bit earlier about how you kind of get to that point where you don't know what else you can do on a character that you're working on. You kind of feel like you're you're at your limit, maybe at your wit's end even a lot of the time. Uh, but once you get to that point, I was kind of talking about you know taking a break and how it's important to to do that. Maybe rest your eyes and your brain a little bit just from looking at something. So you get used to looking at something the more you stare at it. And it's definitely the case when you are attempting to copy something visually 
uh, if you're working from a reference and your objective is to match that as, uh, as accurately as you can. But the reason I recommend for personal projects that you kind of take a break and come back later is so that you can push further on your work. And I think it's really important to try to push just that little bit further every single time and uh, attempt to kind of improve and get a little bit better with every single character that you work on. I'm noticing just like little things here that I'll continue to fix, but if you guys have any questions while we go, feel free to stop me. I'll show you guys another little trick here in a sec for kind of making it easier to recognize mistakes that you've made that you might not recognize any other way. All right. Now, I've kind of just cheated the hood and kind of pulled it down in the middle, but we probably want to either crease this a lot tighter here so it's not this like looping rounded edge here because that that's not how a jacket actually looks it's got this tight kind of connection because that's where the zipper is so we should either tighten that up or actually split this in half physically uh, I think I can get away with kind of just tricking it a little bit by pinching in on this area and visually making it look like it's actually a little bit tighter than it than it really is in there. Distance read is looking a lot better for that little kind of pull in area right there. Let me just kind of offset this a little bit more like what I'm seeing in the concept. And I'll show you guys a cool little trick. So one thing that I really like to do when I'm trying to evaluate my concept and figure out what is wrong, what's going on that I'm not kind of visually noticing. I'll just do a little print screen. If you're on Windows, I don't know what it's called on Apple and then hop into Photoshop, create a new doc, just paste our little screenshot in there and flip our canvas. I have it set up to a hotkey, but if you want to know how to do that, it's just control T and right click, flip horizontal. All right. And then what we can do and just kind of we'll crop in on this guy. And this is a, a little trick that a lot of 2D artists use because it allows you the ability to kind of see things from a new perspective. So typically what I'll do is I'll actually take screenshots of the 360 degrees around my character, like front, back, sides, and maybe a three quarter. And then I'll flip all those at the same time, walk away for like 10 minutes, maybe go grab a quick drink or something, fill up my water bottle, come back, and just kind of look at it and try to pick out all the stuff that really sticks out to me obviously while comparing this to your concept that you have also flipped. So uh, this makes it a lot easier and just kind of giving you a little bit of a new perspective. But you can actually do this in ZBrush. Um, you can manually flip everything in ZBrush if you actually want to continue sculpting on it so you have all your subdivision levels and everything else. But a quick little way to do this is in your merge menu, just click on Merge Visible. Get all that in one subtool here. And you'll notice that my subdivision levels aren't coming through, which is fine. It's not a big deal. And then we'll go into our deformation menu and just click on mirror. And that will rotate or flip everything on our character. And now actually in 3D, we can rotate this guy around and all the stuff that, you know, we didn't really notice before that's really sticking out to us will stick out a lot more. But uh, I've already done this you know, once or twice during our last 10 hours of working on this character. So there are like a few little things that really stick out to me. 
and we can kind of try to correct you know some of these areas and play around with them a little bit more but for the most part you know like I said I'm, I'm pretty happy with this guy for just a quick little fun character here that we could work on during our streams and we'll probably be moving on after this stream with this guy as long as we don't have any additional questions about anything on him all right so from here I would like to play around with the fold over here just making this a little bit more cleanly than what I have currently Try just fixing this fold a little bit. Right now it feels kind of one-sided, kind of like very stuck on. Whereas over here it's more of just kind of represented by a line. It's not really changing the form, so I'm gonna deflate this area just by trimming it back with a trim dynamic brush. And essentially I'm knocking it down on this side where it's built up a little bit too much and building it up a little bit more on this side where I feel like it's a little bit too flat. And then as that wraps down and as well as up, I'm kind of fading that out gradually, which is a little bit of a fundamental called edge quality edge or stroke quality, which I believe I've talked about on stream here more than a few times. But essentially the idea is that, you know, if you're making a, a stroke on a surface or working with lines or, you know, creases, hard edges, soft edges, whatever it is, you don't want the stroke or edge to be the exact same all the way throughout. So that's why we have pens with pressure sensitivity. So on our individual strokes, we can start them a little bit more soft and then they can get a little bit more hard as they go. And then we don't want them ending abruptly like they are right there. So a little bit of a kind of curve. Like if you're if you're thinking about how you're gonna make each individual, individual stroke, you're probably not gonna do so hot, but um, start light, press harder, and then kind of fade out gradually. It's hard to do it if you do it really slow though. So it's definitely something that uh, gets easier with time the faster and more you do it and you'll figure out a nice little kind of swiping angle that you can get for some quick strokes like what I was doing there but yes edge quality keeps us from making boring edges boring shapes altogether all right I think that's starting to feel a lot better. Let's continue, whoops, softening this up just a little bit more. And we'll continue working on some other stuff. Prefer be in our face if we can. All right. Go ahead and do some of the little fine details up here. So some little spots where these are kind of connecting in. Try to do these a little bit smaller. And the resolution of my geometry is actually uh, making those, whoops, a little bit lower than I would like. But I think for the read that we're getting here, it should be fine. Got a couple extra little points here and there. Try to get those in. Looks like that's actually casting a very weird shadow. I don't know if you guys can see this line on your screen.
Very strange. Not sure why that's happening. But let's do a quick little render of this guy, and that'll give me an opportunity to show you guys some quick, easy render settings to get some decent shadows very quickly inside of ZBrush. So up in your render menu under BPR Shadow, Ooh, let that quick save do its thing. BPR Shadow, here we go. I recommend turning down your uh, global strength for your shadows. Uh, I find that they're very strong by default, but play around to find a number that you like. I like around 0.2 or so. Obviously we want more rays, the higher the ray count, the higher uh, higher uh, res we're gonna get out of those shadows, lower that a lot, and you're gonna get really blocky, crappy shadows. And then for the angle, this is essentially going to make the transition between uh, the edge of your shadows a little bit softer. Um, I wouldn't really recommend pushing this over like 30 or so. I, I find that 15 is a pretty good uh, in-between number there. And we're actually not going to mess with anything else because the more stuff we start messing with here, the longer uh, our render is going to take. I just want something quick, and I'll even turn on the floor plane so we get those ground shadows. And we'll just do a quick BPR render and see what we get out of those shadows. And I'll actually show you guys the... Um, I should have done a default render first with the default settings so you can see that. Uh, because it's the default shadows, like I said, are a little bit hard. If you are new to kind of rendering or just doing quick little previs renders in ZBrush like what this is, um, this is essentially a way to alleviate those default kind of lower resolution, harder edged shadows. And I'll show the settings here once again when this is finished. And beautiful, there we go. So we got a nice little render here. I think that looks pretty good. So we got the shadows coming off the whiskers onto the face. I would say that the angle of the light we could probably adjust so we're not getting such a strong shadow coming from the nose onto the sides of the face by the mouth. So I think this area gets a little hard so I could probably rotate the light up to start adjusting that a bit more. But other than that, I think the shadows are working pretty well for that quick little render. And I'm going to actually we're gonna export this guy. Export this little render. And call this our new whip image. Whip. Beautiful. All right. Dead end, what's going on? Welcome. All right, so I'm gonna turn off our ground shadows and let's see, let's adjust our light like a higher, up to the left, light. I'm gonna add in a couple extra lights in here. So I'm adding in a flat light to the front at a very low intensity. It's kind of just our fill light. If you guys are familiar with three-point lighting systems, essentially we want a key light, which is our main light. Uh, we want some kind of fill light, whether that be from the side or from the front, like what I'm doing right now. And then I like to get a nice kind of just over the shoulder backlight. So to do that, let me turn these off, make sure this is in the right place, we'll turn up the intensity, and you can even adjust the color of these lights if you want to. And I think, let's see where we want this. Let's go right about there. Let me turn all these back on. We'll lower our intensity on our little backlight there. And this is something that you could play with forever. I love playing with lighting. That's looking decent enough. Uh, I should also mention that you can only affect the lights if you are using a uh, standard material. If you are using a matte cap, the uh, lighting is baked into that. So for instance, if I grab this gold material and then in the light menu, come in here and turn off all these lights and adjust all those. You can see that 
the gold material is not affected by that. So that is why my Folygon clay material, as well as a lot of really good materials out there, like the Zebro paint material, have uh, are, are standard materials. There are a lot of really cool things that you can do with matte caps, though. Uh, let's do a... Uh, it's also nice when you're working, when you're sculpting. What I like to do is rotate, which is why I have my little light down here on the bottom. The material hasn't updated on that. We are still using the Zebro paint. But um, while you're sculpting, if you're having a little bit trouble, uh, a little bit of trouble kind of like understanding your form, it's nice to be able to shift your light around and cast really hard shadows on a certain area or just make it a little bit easier to see what you're working on. So a lot of the time I will, while sculpting, take the light and kind of do like a little spooky Halloween flashlight under the face kind of effect. And that really helps to just be able to see uh, what is going on in some areas that you might not normally notice. So we're still getting some, uh, some harsher shadows around here but we're starting to brighten up the image a lot nicer. I think this is starting to look better other than the harsh shadows. So I'd probably multi-render composite those out in Photoshop just so they're not quite as rough uh, and try to get a little bit of a more complicated render setup. But in terms of just like one straight render in ZBrush, I think that's pretty good. Let's, uh, let me show you real quick what I was talking about with adjusting the, the light here while you're sculpting. So for instance, a little bit of a spooky spooky flashlight kind of deal. It just helps you, gives you kind of a new understanding similar to kind of flipping your canvas like we were talking about before. Makes things a little bit, um, a little bit different. So you can kind of, kind of work on it more from there and see it in, a, in literally a new light. <laughs> All right, there are a couple other things I wanna do in my face to adjust my eyes. I wanna try scaling them up. So I'm gonna do that really quick here in Transpose Master. Uh, is it possible to put a picture background in ZBrush? Uh, yes, I believe so. I believe it is. I believe there are more than a few ways that you can do that. Uh, this is the Spotlight tool, which is what I'm using right now. It's a great little projection tool, as well as reference image uh, holder, as I like to use it. And it also has the new Snapshot 3D features introduced in ZBrush 2019. So there's a lot of really cool functionality that you can do with this. Um, as well as, I can't remember if it's in your document menu or not, but in terms of if you want to make your document an actual, um, an actual image, I'm not positive if that's paint stop. I don't really want to do this right this second, but I'm sure you could find it with a quick Google. Uh, you could also, you know, put reference images on actual geometry as well as setting your draw palette. I can't remember. I don't, it's not something that I use very often because I prefer using the, uh, the spotlight tool myself. Is the text on the, uh, the bottle here coming off on purpose? Uh, purposefully for now, yes, we need to wrap it around the uh, the bottle. We just have not done that yet. All right, let's get these eyes and head. I essentially just want to scale up this entire area here. Try to make a little bit of a better selection. All right, let's see. Soften that mask just a little bit. And let me try scaling this up. And my eyeballs are gonna poke out my head, I'm sure. <laughs> which is fine. I don't wanna make these too much larger. Whoops, and I don't wanna rotate them, that's for sure. All right, let's try that as a first step. And we will also fix our eyeball, <laughs> so it's not poking out his head. 
So I wanted to create round eyes for this character. I like to try to make my eyes round if I can. A lot of the time though, that's just not possible. So for instance, a good example of that would be like an anime character. They typically have such large eyes that it's just easier to make them flat. And this guy's head is so narrow and small on top that it's just easier to um, kind of squish his eyeballs down. Because his eyeballs have to be quite large in his head. I can show them to you if you want. I've already had to like smoosh them back in so they're not poking out his head, but I'll probably just end up cutting them, removing some of that excess geometry, which is a little bit easier. All right, so I wanted the eyes to be a little bit more visible from the distance read. Because right now, or previously, they were looking a little bit too small for me. So just trying to increase the size of those a little bit more. It's feeling a little bit better. All right, I'm gonna start blending some additional stuff like the sleeves and the sweatshirt. So I'm gonna dynamesh those together really quick. save out an extra copy of my arms in my junk folder just in case I want to roll back and grab those so an interesting thing about Dynamesh is that you can't actually retain both your polygroup information and your polypaint information. So if you have a situation like me where you just have a single color applied to your geometry, whoops, we'll merge those down, we'll also delete our subdivs, then uh, you want to temporarily turn off your polypaint. So right now, this is what our geometry looks like, but if I were to dynamesh those, we would lose those polygroups, which I do not personally want to do. Let me do a quick little Dynamesh here. I might actually close up the holes on this. I forgot that this was an open piece. But essentially I just wanted to merge these together so that I could start working on actually blending that information. Because obviously the sleeve isn't going to have this really hard transition here. That doesn't really make much sense and it looks a little bit silly. So we want to start working on blending and transitioning this now. And as for the geometry that's kind of floating in the middle, we'll take care of that later. Remove that. starting to get there but there are some areas where the um, the way that is transitioning isn't super clean so I would like to make that more clean through a little bit of remeshing very quickly just some quick automatic processes Uh, for this, I'll probably aim for around 3,000 polys. What's also great with ZBrush 2019, someone was asking if it's safe to uh, upgrade earlier, and it's absolutely safe, and I would highly encourage it because there's things like the new version of ZRemesher, which is a lot more accurate and super awesome for stuff like hard surface objects, and uh, the poly count gets a lot closer to what you're aiming for. I mean, it's good stuff. Does a lot of a lot of new little things. 
that are very much desired, but our little tight area here in the sweatshirt is going to cause us some issues. So that is also another reason why I wanted to kind of cut that up and separate these two halves. Not only is that how it would be physically, the real sweatshirt, you know, with an actual zipper in there, I more so wanted to do a quick route and just create the representation of that form though. Let this finish up and do a quick little projection. That's a little bit better. See if it'll project fine. Yeah, we're getting uh, quite a bit of stretching there, which I am never a fan of. But we can rework that in a second. I more so want to get the sleeves transitioning a little bit more um, more cleanly, and then we can worry about <laughs> that catastrophe in there. So now I'm going to use subdivision levels to my advantage by stepping up and down through those and using stuff like my smooth clay tubes and trim dynamic brush to gradually start blending. And this is a little harder when you just have a singular high resolution piece of geometry. We can already see that it's starting to transition a lot more nicely with the use of lower subdivision levels. And I'll just soften this crease because some of the geometry was getting a little, a little kind of like noisy, almost I would call it. So very light, gentle, smooth there. Be very careful when you do that kind of thing because it's very easy for you to, you know, erase a lot of hard work that you did. Try to be gentle with that smooth brush. The smooth brush is an awesome feature. I love it, but it's also very, very destructive if you're not careful. This one is blending a lot worse over here, so it's gonna take a little bit more TLC, I think. And I'm having a little trouble seeing, so let's go back to our clay sculpting material. Getting there, starting to shape up. Oh, come back. All right. So that's starting to feel a lot better. There might be some areas where we can tighten up and clean up some creases. Other than that, this is feeling a lot better to me. I kind of want to blend that a little bit sooner up here. Such a weird kind of arm shape going on here for both of these arms. I'm not, I, I think it's a really cool silhouette. Some of it is, you know, pushed pretty far. And I really like designs that are pushed really far. It's just that it's really difficult to translate that stuff to 3D in a really kind of appealing way from multiple angles. Of course, you can always match the silhouette from the front, but, you know, I see awesome 3D models all the time that, you know, they look great from the front, and then you see the side view, the profile, or a three-quarter view, or, you know, you just start rotating around a little bit, and it really starts to fall apart. 
So being able to revolve a shape and make it look good from every single angle is really important and it's also really hard on stuff like this. So it takes a little bit of extra time and care to make sure that it's looking good from every which way. We're getting there. Should also mention now, before I forget, I said I was going to talk about it later, but uh, my new course, Mastering Appeal, is coming out on Thursday, this Thursday. Or I should say registration is opening for that on Thursday. It's something that I've been talking about for quite a long time. If you've hung out on my streams in the past, or on my YouTube channel, It is, or it has been, about eight months in the making. And essentially the course is a seven week long program that takes you through the uh, fundamentals of creating appealing characters. Much like, whoops, much like the uh, cute little tiger boy that we're creating right now. Uh, it does have a focus more so on creating human characters but uh, the information is, you know, obviously transferable, also transferable to uh, anthropomorphic animals, human anthropomorphic characters, animals, etc. You know, everything. Uh, but it's a seven week long program. I'm very excited about it. Uh, if you guys are interested in registering for that, I'm going to be opening registration on Thursday and probably the best way to hear about it or like be one of the first to uh, know about it once registration goes live is by uh, checking out my YouTube channel because I will be releasing the info there first and a little bit later in the day on the rest of my social media. So all the people that follow me on YouTube will be the first to hear about it. I expect registration to go pretty quickly because there's a very limited number of seats because I'm actually something that I'm, you know, interacting with you guys live with each week. So, you know, it's not something that can scale to, uh, you know, 100 people or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's going to be... Uh, what What else? What else? If you guys have any questions, I can, I can talk about it. I said it was a seven week long program. It includes lectures each week that average on about an hour to two hours in length, as well as uh, project based homework assignments that essentially take you through the entire process of creating a character, much like this one in ZBrush. Uh, live uh, live sessions for Q&A, as well as uh, just kind of picking my brain about whatever, uh, that you guys can actually interact with me in a private chat that we will have verbally, if you want, with a microphone, uh, as well as uh, critiques every single week on your progress as you move through the program. So, yeah. The jam, this, this old dude, or this is old dude, the, uh, the concept is old, or, or I am old. I'm definitely not old. <laughs> if anything, I look, uh, look much younger than I really am. BMS, Nuclear Dan, what is up? Welcome back, man. How are you doing? Nuclear Dan would come and hang out on my stream all the time, back over on my Twitch channel. Unfortunately, because I've been working on my course so long, I haven't had a lot of time for streaming. But once my, uh, once my course releases, I plan on having a lot more time uh, for Twitch and YouTube and all that good stuff. I don't know if you guys can see that little square pattern there. This happens from time to time. While stepping up and down through subdivision levels, polypaint can get messed up. It's a very uh, interesting little artifact. Make sure we clear that. There we go. And I also want to show you guys a little thing that I like to do on... Well, for painting a lot of different things, actually. I'm going to use the color spray, as well as an Alpha 07. With RGB on a very low intensity, somewhere around like uh, 10, 15 or so. And... Maybe we'll do it a little bit higher just so you can see the effect in its full grandeur. It's a very uh, very strong effect, which is why I have the sensitivity turned down so low. 
Essentially what I'm going to do is add a little bit of noise to the, uh, the fabric here. And the smaller your brush size, the smaller these dots will be as well. Like I said, I'm also lowering the RGB intensity to make that even less visible. And then I'll show you a trick to make it even uh, less apparent as we go there. We just want a little bit of noise on this. You can also do this with the noise maker, which I'll show you guys in just a moment here. <laughs> there is logic and then there is pixo logic. Hmm. Well, that's deep. I wouldn't even, I'd have to contemplate on that one for a while. Terribly, uh, terribly busy with your masters. Well, that sounds like a very important uh, piece of paper to go after for sure. Uh, I wish I had time to enroll in your course. Absolutely. Well, it is something that I will be offering multiple times in the future. It's not a, uh, a one-time deal. So for those that um, are still interested in registering and also have the time, uh, do not uh, fret if you don't get in, if the seats you know, sell out too quick and you can't get in for the first one. I will be doing more uh, sessions in the future. So it's not like it's a one-time deal or anything like that. So no worries. Ooh, getting lots of lots of noise up in here and a nice quick save all right I'm just being pretty liberal here with this just trying to do this relatively quick so you guys can get an idea for what we're looking for so here we go we've added a little bit of uh, noise to our jacket now at this stage, if you would like to uh, decrease the level of noise on something like this, what I recommend doing is using the fill object button with your RGB intensity. So by default, if your RGB intensity is set to 100 and you click on fill object, as long as RGB is checked up here, it will fill in that color on your geometry, right? So if I have this blue color, I can just click and fill that in. But if you set your RGB intensity to something like, let's say 50, and I'll do that red color again and click, oh, you notice that it's not red. It's not the same red. And that's because the 50 up here indicates a 50% infill of that color. So imagine uh, you have like a Photoshop layer on top with that color and it's set to 50%. It would create that like purplish color. So what we'll do is we'll select the same blue with a low RGB intensity value of 10 or something like that. And essentially I'll just click this a couple times and it will slowly fade out that little noise that I have. So if I set this to 100, you'll see if I click, the noise just completely disappears. It might be a little bit hard to see on the stream. Hopefully you guys can see it popping up. But the more I want, or the less I want that to appear, I can just sit here and I play with the setting and kind of fill it in a little bit more and just click this a few times. Let's see, maybe we'll do like 25%. Fill that, there we go. So that's starting to uh, kind of fade that out a little bit more. But let's say we want to get like some physical noise on this. Uh, I think probably one of the easiest ways to do that is by using the surface noise menu here. And I'll turn off the, uh, the color blend because we don't want to affect that. We can zoom in. Got this tiny little window, sorry, I can't make this any larger. Um, but we'll just zoom in here and hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. Uh, so I will increase the size of our noise. We're just gonna use the default noise for this. You can hopefully see that getting a little bit larger. Uh, I find that the default strength for the noise, but, and I'm not sure why, why this works the way it does, uh, the strength slider goes all the way up to, you know, 0.5 and minus 5, but really uh, you want a pretty small value on the strength of your noise. Uh, I, w I wish there was a little bit more uh, differentiation in, in the values of the strength. I wish it was more a scale of like minus 100 to 100 so that you didn't have to deal so much in small decimals, but it, it doesn't really matter what the value of the number is. It still has the same same effect, right? So what we can do is we can just click and apply that. 
and get a little pre-visualization of what that noise looks like. But this isn't actually on the geometry. We can just toggle this on and off very quickly without uh, really affecting anything. But if we want to apply that, we need to click the Apply to Mesh button. And in my experience, whenever you click Apply to Mesh, the noise is typically a little bit weaker than what it looks like in the previs. And that's a, I think that's just kind of how it works, but uh, it, the, obviously the noise is dependent on the, um, the resolution of your geometry. So I would assume that it also has a little something to do with that. If I step down subdivision levels, you can see that the noise is still applied on here, even though it's a low res geometry. So that's how you know it's just a pre-visualization. So I'll go ahead and apply that. We'll say sure. Let's go with that little just rough noise. Click apply to mesh. Now we have a little bit more noise. That's actual geometric noise at this point. So if I turn off everything for the color and material, you can see that we have a little bit of that, that breakup going on there, even though we have no polypane or anything like that. So that's a quick little way that you guys can get noise on your models. And if you want to be a little bit more specific with the noise that you create, inside of the noise plug, if we go to edit, there is, uh, I'm sorry, the noise plug inside of the noise plug. So if you go to surface noise, edit your noise up here, click on noise plugin or noise plug. And uh, there are a variety of different, um, different little patterns that you can choose from. So for instance, uh, let's just choose the weave pattern and click on OK. And you can also mix this with basic noise and all sorts of awesome cool little things in here, but let's just um, we'll adjust our scale for our noise. Oops. And hopefully you can see that little weave pattern starting to come through. I'll make it a little bit stronger. And there you go. So there are a lot of different cool noise patterns that you can play with in there. And this is a, it's not a triplanar projection, I don't believe, to my knowledge. Uh, but there will be some warping on it. And if you have warping and you want to get rid of it, if you have a piece of geometry that has UVs set up and you use the UV option here, I don't have UVs on this, so it's not working. We could create some quick UVs and maybe try it out. Um, but uh, the UV will be a lot more accurate and not give you quite as much stretching and stuff like that. So let's click OK on that little pattern just so you can kind of see what that looks like here and how it's uh, kind of stretching over here on the side. So I think it's just a planar projection. Um, I'm not sure if that's entirely correct. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, but yes, it's still very powerful with just the default settings, especially if you're trying to do something really quick. Uh, let me go ahead and turn this off. So we'll turn off our little previs on our noise. Uh, and yeah, what else? What else can we do here? Uh, Chris is asking, hey, Felidon, can you tell me why my smooth brush is messing up my mesh? It's like it's making ripples instead of smoothing. I don't know. Uh, does it look like this? So here's my smooth brush. Is that what it looks like? Is it adding like noise to your geometry? Uh, if that is the case, then uh, you are using the opposite or alt effect for the brush stroke. Uh, every brush has an alt stroke or a uh, opposite interaction, including the smooth brush. So you guys all know our good pal, the smooth brush, right? It allows you to smooth geometry by holding the shift key. That is the default hotkey for activating the smooth brush. Uh, but if you hold the shift key, you see Z add Z sub. We can turn on Z sub up here. And then if I smooth, you can see that it's adding noise instead. So it's like the opposite effect of a smooth brush. It's unsmoothing our geometry. Uh, it's really strong by default though. So uh, if you do want to use it to add noise, you got to turn it down really low. So uh, hold the Alt key and see if that you know normally smooths. And then if that works, that's your problem. So you just need to come up here while holding the Shift key for smooth and click on Z add and you should be good to go. No, no, that is not your issue. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, I think without a screenshot or actually being able to see your file, uh, it's a little hard for me to understand what you mean by your smooth brush is making ripples. 
instead of smoothing. It might, uh, there's a high probability that it has to do with just your topology and that you just have some wonky edge loops going on and uh, when you are relaxing the geometry, which is what the smooth brush does, it's actually um, reconforming back to the topology that you had, which has those weird ripples in it. There's a lot of things that it could be. Like I said, without seeing it, it's really hard for me to know. Uh, Larry Deer says, this is really cool. Well, thank you, Larry. Appreciate it, man. Did you apply the noise in the lowest subdivision level? Absolutely not. Uh, the noise, you should apply at your highest subdivision level because it is a geometric modifier and you want it to um, you want to be able to get the most resolution out of it. So you don't want to apply it at your, your lowest subdiv because you probably won't get any effect out of most noises at a very low subdiv uh, subdivision level. I'm going to work on this transition down here a little bit more. You know what? Uh, let's... Um, I need to dynamesh these because if you look down here there is a hole in our geometry and these legs are just kind of a mess. Amen. <laughs> so let's um, let's dynamesh these up. It's got a little bit of a tiger tiger toe which we pointed out during our last stream I believe as well. Uh, do I want these poly groups? No, we're good. We don't need them. All right, let's check our resolution, make sure everything is fine here. I think we should be good. Um, I'll mess with that in a minute. Let me go ahead and do the remesh really quick. Uh, the noise or the topology might be the issue. It's very possible. Like I said, there's... Off the top of my head, I think I had like two or three different things it could be, and I'm sure there's a lot more problems that it could be. Larry Deer asks, uh, is, is it all done in ZBrush? I assume... Talking about our tiger boy here. Yes, every single thing here was created in ZBrush. Uh, if you want to watch the entire process, it's actually over on my YouTube channel. I think there's a link somewhere at the top of the screen. It's just YouTube slash Folygon. You can watch it all from beginning to end. We'll put him up in the uh, the corner while I work on his, his booty down here. All right. Doing a subdivide and project. A couple more of these and we should be good. Chris, you got it worked out. Awesome, man. I'm not sure which one it was that ended up being the issue, but I'm glad you got it figured out. Good, good work. All right, let's fix our pantaloons. Now that we have something a little bit easier uh, to work with that has fixed our holes. Fix our holes, that is not something you hear somebody say every day. But we did it, we fixed them. All right, let's transition this a little bit better up through here. Because right now it goes from this kind of tight hard edge and it just stops right there it feels really awkward to me so let's soften these transitions earlier in the stream i said you know what this guy's done i would be fine you know it's just like a personal project saying he's done but there's always more things that we can we can find and continue to develop on right there's always more room for improvement just gotta what's the what's the saying your artwork is never finished, only ever abandoned, or something like that. It's pretty much the case. I would, I would agree with that. 
Gotta call it quits at some point. Luckily on, uh, you know, client work, there's somebody to tell you when something is done. But on personal stuff, you have to be the, the, um, the project lead in a way. You get to say when something is done, which is a lot of responsibility. Trying to figure out what this looks like by itself. <laughs> like a pair of ears, a weird hat. A pair of chicken legs, something. <laughs> All right, let me blend that a little bit more up through here. Not a very good transition right now. But we're getting there. Like I said earlier, if you're having trouble seeing, especially with a darker color like that, switch back to your clay sculpting material that you use, if you have one. If you don't, you can get my material, which is over on my Gumroad, gumroad.com slash polygon. I love this material. Or I always recommend that people use the basic material. I think the basic material is a really good material for sculpting. Basic and basic too are just, they're basic and they work very well. But I like my material because it's a little bit easier on the eyes especially for long sculpting sessions. Easy on the eyes. <laughs> that booty though. Just came home, it's 1 a.m. here. Oh no, what, what are you doing up? Go get some sleep. If I were you, I'd be passed out, be zonked. Uh, it was your first suggestion. Sorry for the confusion. Oh, it was the uh, the uh, smooth brush just being inversed. That was me guess. Made the, at least that was the first thing that came to my mind. All right, these are feeling a bit better, especially in that transitional area. So we can turn the poly paint and material on. We should also do uh, a little bit of painting to try to get a little bit more noise in here, like what I'm seeing. I, you know, looking at this, it would be kind of fun to like hand paint some of these highlights. I don't typically like hand painting light and shadow for a lot of things because I think it gets, I think it gets really heavy handed really quick, and it can look really bad if you do that. And we don't want things to look bad. You, you kind of gotta, if you're gonna do it, I think you need to be very subtle with it. For, for like painting in shadowed areas, or you need to be very uh, heavy handed and intentional with it. Uh, like um, like going all in on hand painted style, like a world, world of Warcraft character or something like that. The giant. We're going back to adding some random noise onto our clothing. Our pantaloons are looking a bit boring. And I know this looks really weird and heavy handed, but the noise will make more sense soon, I promise. And I'll show you guys a little trick so you don't have to set up your noise every single time as well. So if you find a noise setting that you like in your noise plugin, let, let me fill this in really quick. Oop, oop. Just kind of nullify that a little bit. But if you find a quick uh, little noise setting that you like, and like I did here on the jacket, so I found something that worked fairly well for just kind of creating a quick little break up there. Uh, we can go back into our surface and noise, go back into edit and find the noise that we created. I think I messed this up a little bit, but I'll show you guys 
uh, the feature that I want to show you, which is that you can save out your noise if you want, or if you want to copy it, you can just click on copy. We'll close that, go down to our pants, activate the noise plugin again, and just click on paste, and it'll paste in the noise that we stored in memory. So this looks really, really strong. So let's um, let's turn the strength down a lot. Oof, oof, oof. No color blend, strength by mask one, that's all fine. Maybe the scale you can mess with. I know this window is really tiny and difficult to see, but I can't make it any bigger. And I want this to be pretty small and subtle, so let's just apply that, and that'll work for me. Just a quick little break up there. Oh, and we got some more noise on this. I need to turn this off. All right, so that's how you copy and paste your noise, or even save it out if you want to do that. But I have some other things here that I need to add noise to, and just some other small things that need to be taken care of as well. Oh, you know what? He needs some stripes on his little muzzle up here. I completely forgot about these. I need to get those in there. And maybe, I'm not sure, it's very small and hard for me to tell, but it looks like he has like a little stripe ring on his head. He also has this little alfalfa hair going on here which I do have, but I think it looks kind of dumb. It looks really silly. Maybe if I make it like super thin, I'll keep it in. I don't remember where I put it in my junk, my junk folder. So he does have this like little alfalfa hair going on on the top of his head. I don't know if it's on purpose, so that's kind of why I left it off. I don't know. We'll, we'll play with it later. I don't know if I'll include it in the, uh, the final image or not. Tiger, that's right, me tiger boy. Looks quite cool, well thank you, appreciate it. After our stream today, we will be at the 12 hour mark. Uh, again, if you guys want to watch the entire process from the beginning to uh, the end, or where we are now, uh, that's over on my YouTube channel. Well, let's see. Um, so I have in my notes the text thing. I want to fix the wrapping for the text here, obviously. I don't want it floating and sticking off the bottle. It looks silly. Uh, but I can't remember the deformer that does that off the top of my head, so I'll mess with it uh, a little bit later. I'm going to add some uh, breakup to a few more pieces here uh, and fix some stuff up in the hood. I want to combine some, uh, some geometry up there. Let's do this really quick. Get some more visual breakup. And this is something that I just want to do really quick. And I'm going to copy the noise that I made from my pants and copy that over here to my jacket. Really easy. This is like interpenetrating the geometry there, which doesn't look super hot. So I'm gonna pull that out. And no, I'm not going to use the matchmaker brush for the letters. Somebody asked, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't know if that was you or not. Somebody asked about using 
uh, they mentioned a brush that does that, and I asked if they meant the matchmaker brush. They never said anything. There it is. So the reason I don't want to use the matchmaker brush here, I can try to make it work as best as I can, but it's very finicky and kind of gotta be a little um, gotta have the right type of geometry for it. The way these there's so few vertices in this font, in this text. It's going to be a little kind of what I'm expecting to happen right now, which is not, it's not doing exactly what I need it to. So it's not being terrible. I'll try a really large brush. Maybe we can get a little bit better luck here. So yeah, we're, we're getting there. It's, it's trying, <laughs> but there are obviously some areas where it doesn't want to cooperate. And that is because of the type of geometry here that we have for our font, which is why I'm not using that. Plus we can get a lot more accurate result with a curve deformer that will wrap that around. But I just need to look up what that deformer is called so that I can grab it. Mm, grab it. And I need to figure out what's going to happen with the stripes around the mouth because I don't think a lot of care was given to, um, to these stripes. Like, where do these stripes go? Do they just end on the face? Are they just like these little, little pieces right here? Is that all they are? It kind of feels awkward that it's just like right there on the mouth to me. I don't know, maybe it's not that terrible. What do you guys think? I think it looks like it, um, so it's kind of like stuck on. If I put two of these right here. I think from the front it'll look fine, but from the, because you start rotating around, it, it'll kind of feel weird to just have them stop right there. I don't know. We can play around with it. Maybe it won't feel that bad once we, uh, get them really, really defined in here. Yes, I, I do like the matchmaker brush, but like I said, it requires a really specific type of uh, geometry to work with, which the Text 3D tool, that low poly geometry is not being incredibly cooperative with uh, with what we had there. And this really doesn't need to be super precise here for this. Cause I'll probably be um, adjusting it after I extrude it. I'll be using the same, same technique that I used to create the stripes on the head as well as the stripes on the tail. So for those that did not see the tail stripes and how we did those, I actually cheated a little bit and just kind of sliced up geometry really quick. We can even close holes on these if we want, but this is actual physical geometry just kind of pulled off the surface a little bit, extruded off the surface, I should say just so we can make them quick. So I don't have to poly paint incredibly precisely for some stripes. I'm trying to find my whiskers. So we're getting some really strong, awkward, uh, there we go, some strong, awkward shadows on the face. I won't uh, give quite as much attention to this side. All right. So now, hopefully this will work out. We'll just do a basic, so we could do the extraction down here, which is fine. 
Uh, but typically what I like to do is manually extract geometry for a few reasons. Uh, it allows me to uh, control how thick I want it to be. And in this case, I want it to be paper thin. So the extraction that I'll get from that will be a little finicky to play around with. Plus there's no way to preview it quickly. It has to calculate on each preview, which is very, very frustrating to work with. So I will just polygroup these. And do a couple quick operations. Edge loop, group loop, control W to polygroup everything. Z remesh. 0.1 poly count target. Now I just did a lot of things really quickly. And if you guys want to check out the process, it is over on my YouTube channel. Just find the part where I made these stripes and I talk in depth about everything that I just did and a few other techniques for, for doing what I just did. But essentially, I've created some quick geometry here that I'm going to use for some stripes. We'll bridge these up. some nice quick quad strips that are matching our surface as good as they could at this low res. And now I just need to modify and clean these up. Uh, but we're getting a little low on time. So I will do a little bit of this, but then I'll give you guys the last 10 minutes here to ask any uh, additional questions or anything like that. Feel free to pop them in chat now before we head out. Again, my, uh, what is, we gotta try there. Oh, we got something real weird going on. <laughs> yeah, let me fix that. Let me do that. Uh, again, my, my course is opening up for registration on Thursday, that is April the 4th. For those that didn't hear about it earlier, it's called Mastering Appeal. It's a seven week long program uh, where each week you receive uh, on average an hour to two hour lecture, uh, project-based homework that takes you through the entire process of creating uh, stylized and appealing characters, obviously. Of course, it's called Mastering Appeal. Similar to uh, something like our Tiger Boy that we're working on right now. Hopefully not with uh, blue stripes, though. <laughs> um, as well as live sessions for Q&A and uh, kind of questions and picking my brain, stuff like that. And um, lot, uh, critiques each, each week as well. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in, um, if you've hang out here. Uh, you'll, you'll probably hear about it again in the future next week when I'm streaming at the same time on Tuesday. I would stream on every Tuesday. But uh, if you guys are interested in registering and hearing more, you can uh, check out my YouTube channel, which I believe there's a link at the top of the screen for. Or uh, follow me on my Twitter account. Just Google Folygon and you'll probably be able to find some info. Uh, but this Thursday, I am very excited for it. And I know a lot of you are as well. Something that I've been working on for quite a while. Van, what is going on? Welcome. Any tips for, for Z remeshing the body? How do I get more topology on the face and less on the body? Well, I'm glad you asked because that's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, let me show you a quick little trick just using a sphere. So within Ziri Mesher, scroll on down here to Ziri Mesher, there are a lot of different little buttons and tools and all sorts of crazy stuff in here. 
but there's this one down here that says use polypaint and essentially what we are going to do is use polypaint let me just set up my brush here make sure that you have a brush this uh, something like the standard brush will work totally fine for this um, and make sure that you have RGB turned on for it. You probably want to turn off Z add and Z sub. But essentially what you can do is use the color density here to adjust and begin painting on certain areas. So I've made the color density here four. So essentially what I'm saying is where I paint this four or red, I want the density of the polygons to be more dense there or four times more dense than an area where at let's say 0.25 down here, I'd want the resolution to be a lot less. And then everywhere where that is unpainted is the neutral kind of kind of one, right? So after you do that, keep that use poly paint checked. So you'd poly paint your face red if you wanted to get more topology in there, and then zero mesh it from there. So where I had the red paint, you can see how it's gotten a lot more dense here. And where I had the blue paint, you can see where it's gotten a lot less dense here. Um, and then of course, obviously affecting your zero mesh target poly count will affect that as well. That's a quick little way that you can do it. There's also some really cool stuff that you can do with poly groups. If you are interested in that kind of thing, I have a ton of tutorials over on my YouTube channel where I do exactly uh, stuff just like that all the time. So come and hang out and um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff over there. A lot of, lot of tutorials, lots of, lots of good stuff. The cost of the course is $600 for the entire seven weeks program. And that includes everything with that that I just mentioned. No problem, Van, happy to help out. Uh, if I had to rig this character later, what would I do to prepare for rigging? Uh, if I were to rig this character, well, first I wouldn't pose it. I wouldn't sculpt the pose like I've done for it right now. Uh, you would obviously want to keep this in a in a neutral pose, but to prepare it for rigging, you would. Uh, oh, let me change my material on the paints. So uh, this would need to be in a neutral pose, something that is preferably uh, symmetrical save you a lot of time, a lot of work. Uh, that's not necessarily always the case though, but uh, we would need to first retopo our character. So if you wanna rig something, it needs to have topology that is going to deform properly for animation. And what we have right now is not geometry or topology that is uh, manually made in such a way that would properly deform for, for animation. So we would first need to retopologize our character manually uh, get everything kind of set up in that regard. And then we could take it into something like Maya and begin setting up our skin weights after we set up our joints for rig. Sculptress Pro, Sculptress Pro is great, yeah. Uh, I typically use Dynamesh, but I think Sculptress Pro is a really cool tool. The main, uh, the main reason I don't use Sculptress Pro too often um, is because it doesn't work with auto masking features. And I use auto masking features for uh, a lot of different things. Um, one of the main ones that you guys are probably familiar with or have heard a lot is called backface masking, um, which is, uh, what's a good, uh, let's do it on here. We'll do it on this font, this text. So for example, if I use my move brush on this, I move the vertices around, right? Wow. Crazy. I know. But if you turn on backface masking, which is located in your brush menu under auto masking, wherever that is, there it is. Auto masking, backface masking right here. So you can find that, turn it on, go crazy. Let me turn it back on. Essentially what backface masking, this is just one of many auto masking features, is it allows you to uh, not affect the geometry on the back side that you are sculpting on. So with something like the move brush, it will only move the geometry 
in the uh, the way that you are directing it. So you can see that it's not affecting it going the opposite way there. So that's very nice for a lot of different things. So I could do that with my transpose line or 3D gizmo. Instead of moving the geometry, I could turn on back face masking and move the geometry. And it's not moving it, but it's actually uh, extending it. And then if you need to kind of fix that, you can do a quick little, let me turn off back face masking, clip. Come on, there we go. So you clip that. That's like one way to do that. That's not the way that I would do that. If I was <laughs> if I was extending this, I would just use my transpose line and do this, which is a little stretch function. You can hold the shift key and use the move. There, I have a YouTube tutorial on the transpose line if you guys want to learn more about it and all the beautiful secret hidden little functions in that. But yes, uh, you can't use auto masking, so that is why I would not, uh, I do not typically use Sculptress Pro. Michael, what is up? Welcome. Well, welcome and also goodbye because unfortunately we are out of time, guys. So I will have to do those little stripes on the, the face a little bit later. But uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Hopefully we've been able to answer a lot of questions tonight and just kind of hang out and show some, some new processes maybe. A bunch of other stuff. But yes, he's looking pretty good. Let's do... Uh, just a quick little render. I already have my render settings set up from earlier, so if you guys want to take a screenshot, if you're looking for a quick way to get some decent shadows out of ZBrush, there's that. Let me turn my lights back on. We'll even turn our floor. Uh, I think our floor plane's going to give us some weird, weird stuff there, so I won't turn on the floor with all the lights that I've set up right now. We'll do a quick little render, but let's see. <laughs> Tiberius Tigerson, that's right. I asked you guys to name him, and I don't think we ever decided on a final name. Tiberius Tigerson is very, very good, though. I like it. Um, he is... Huh. I think he's heading to the gym. So I think he's... I think he's on his way to the gym. He's not, you know, he's not sweating, so Tiberius Tigerson is... He's probably about to load up on that, that Nitro Stalker and go to the gym. Thanks for the tips, no problem, man. Thank you for your time, absolutely. Zanaseneru <laughs> Kitsune. Thanks, man. Uh, Tiger looks awesome, thank you. And it's looking great. Well, thank you, guys. Um, I think that's gonna be it. We'll, I'll figure out the font thing and I'll hopefully be able to tell you about um, the deformer during the next stream. But again, this Thursday, my Mastering Appeal class, be on the lookout. Check out my YouTube channel if you guys want to hear more about that. I'll be announcing it uh, at... Uh, what was... That? Let me make sure I have the correct time real quick. So it's April 4th, Thursday at... Uh, let me... I don't want to... don't want to tell you guys the wrong time. at 9 a.m. Eastern US time. So if you guys are interested in registering for it, uh, that would be the time to go to my YouTube channel to make sure that you guys can uh, get in for the registration for those that are interested. Uh, I expect it to sell out pretty quick. It's a very limited number of seats, so kind of a first come, first serve basis. So uh, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate all the kind words. And again, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. And I will see you at the same time, same place next Tuesday. All right. See you guys.